Good morning. It's great to be together and to uh, open up the scriptures as we have come to, to worship him and remind one another of our mutual salvation. We're back in Colossians this morning. And last week, we saw that since we have died with Christ, as is the case, Paul asks the Colossians, why are you dogmatized? Why do the traditions of religious teachers who pound you with dogma, why do you listen to that? And what is their message? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. And now we'll pick up that where Paul will further elaborate why we need to listen to Christ and his apostles and not those who want to dogmatize us. So the passage today, Colossians 2, 22 and 23, I'm reading from the new RSV because I found it brought out the text very nicely. All these regulations refer to things that perish with use. They are simply human commands and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-imposed piety, humility, and severe treatment of the body, but they are of no value in checking self-indulgence. Let's pray. Thank you, dear Lord, that you have inspired your word, that we might learn, we might grow, we might be conformed to the image of your son, Jesus. May we listen with ears of faith and obey what you've said so that we might be preserved and sanctified by your grace. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Now back to verse 22, Colossians chapter 2. All these regulations refer to things that perish with use. They are simply human commands and teachings. Literally in the Greek, the commands and teachings of men. Now, uh, one of the verses that controls and explains and outlines the message of Colossians is Colossians 2.8. So we need to see that this passage, 2.22, is continuing along the theme that was laid out in Colossians 2.8. So if you happen to be open to Colossians 2, maybe you can look back at verse 8. I'll read it to you. It says, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy. Literally, it says the philosophy. An empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, or literally the stoichia, the hostile powers, and literally not ac according to Christ, or here rather than according to Christ. Colossians 2.8 lays out the program for the epistle. Three times it says, whether according to tradition, according to the hostile powers, and not Christ. So verse 22 picks up on that. These are regulations. They came from a questionable source. What is binding on the Christian is the teaching of Christ and his apostles. we said that over and over, haven't we? Christ is the head of the church. Christ, God incarnate, speaks the truth, and speaks for God. And we are told in both Mark 7 and Luke 7, by a voice from heaven, from the Father, this is my son, listen to him. 
It shocks me how many people email me to debate. They want to listen to everything but Christ. In fact, one guy was saying Christ had a different gospel and we don't have to listen to it. It was only for some Jews. Can you imagine thinking I don't have to listen to Christ? Well, it's a bad idea. So here are some regulations that are saying, don't touch, don't handle, don't taste. Now, we should see here that this is what Jesus was talking about in Mark 7, and we'll get to that in our applications. The regulations are things about things that perish. Perish is the word in the Greek that means they, they dissolve. Once you ate your hash browns, they're never going to be hash browns again. Enough said. Physical dissolution. They're not going to make you spiritual. They're not going to keep you from the gospel, nor are they going to bring you to the gospel. It's about the gospel. It's about faith in the finished work of Christ. Not about do not touch, do not handle, do not taste. According to Colossians 2.20, we died with Christ to the teachings of man. Here it says there are human commands and teachings. The same Greek phrase exactly is found in the Septuagint of Isaiah 29.13, also alluded to in Mark chapter 7. And so we have for the Colossians teachers who are demanding that the Colossians obey everything they say. And in the entire history of the church always there has arisen human teachings, human traditions, human commands that have been given and those who give them demand you obey me because I told you so because I speak for God now what Paul is doing Paul the Apostle who really does speak for God remember there back when I preached through Galatians they had debates and issues going on Christ and his Apostles do speak for God and we do have to obey them we do have to believe the promises of God and we aren't lawless but under the law of Christ and those people who would forbid marriage as we saw last week or think that certain diets are going to make you holy are not speaking for God let's go to the next Part here, 23a. I'm going to divide this up because there's important words that we need to learn. These, now what does these refer to? The human commands, do not touch, do not handle, do not taste. These in, have indeed an appearance of wisdom. Or it could be translated a reputation of wisdom in promoting here's an interesting word self-imposed piety self-imposed piety the word appearance here is logos but in the context means reputation those who teach strict asceticism the severe treatment of the body, often have many followers. These followers assume that their stern restrictions must come from valid wisdom. But in fact, according to Paul, they come from the philosophy, Colossians 2.8. There are whole systems of religion that have been set up 
in history under the name of Christ that teach human traditions, that bind people to ideas and teachings that did not come from Christ and did not come from any of his true apostles. There are people who claim to be the apostle of Christ. There are people today who claim to be apostles and prophets, and they claim to speak for God, and they claim to bind our consciences. And like in the day of Jesus, when the Pharisees and scribes became irate and wanted Jesus dead because he wouldn't submit to their traditions, those today who teach the traditions of men will get so irate that if they could, they'd kill you if you don't listen to them. So these are human commands. But true wisdom, according to the book of Colossians, is found in Christ. It's no uh, surprise as I study the message of this glorious epistle the Colossians 1 contains the Christ hymn, the glories of Christ, the sufficiency of Christ, the supremacy of Christ, the preeminence of Christ, the wisdom that God has revealed in Christ. In him, we have true wisdom. It says in Colossians 2 and verse 3, in whom, Christ, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Where are we going for our wisdom and knowledge? Shouldn't it be to Christ? Has he not spoken? Does he not care for us? Has he not given us many great promises? We'll look at that in a bit. These traditions of men seem to have wisdom, According to the Bible, they're worthless. They appear pious. Oh, was I deceived by this when I was a young man. I think it was my own appetite that led to the deception. I wanted to be a better Christian than any other Christian. And when I was in Bible college, I was on a quest to be the best possible Christian in that whole Bible college. What I managed to become is totally disgusting. Kind of an annoyance to everybody around me. Until God got through to me through the scripture and I realized I was the problem. It's a privilege to be part of the family of God and to be partakers of the promises of Christ. There's no value in thinking I'm better than somebody else. I'm not. I remember a movie that there was a, it was about uh, the author of the song Amazing Grace, John Newton. And in the film, I thought it was a good film, but in it, he's a blind person in a church mopping the floor. And someone found Newton and asked him what he knew and what he learned. He said, I know two things, this old blind man mopping the floor. Number one, I'm a great sinner. Number two, Christ is a greater savior. As I saw that movie, I brought tears to my eyes. No, it's not that I'm so great and glorious. No, I'm not. But Christ is a great Savior. I hope you know him today. Now, I broke out this word, and don't let this seem a little technical to you, but I told you a story a while back how I was in Bible college, and I was in this bondage of trying to be such a great Christian, one of my teachers asked me to go through here and translate it from the Greek, and I couldn't. But later, I found some great resources through Clinton Arnold, and this word here 
there's a key word in the passage we're studying that is translated self-chosen piety in the version that I quoted is thelo threskia is two words in the Greek the word for will to choose and the word for worship as it was used in Colossians 2.18 and there's a debate about what does it mean what kind of religion did they have in Asia Minor that's characterized as self-chosen piety my friends and brothers and sisters in Christ this is the religion of post-modernity for us they had their own version but today the prevailing idea in the world that we live in is that everybody gets to choose their own religion and they're all valid It's one thing, I would affirm that I'm glad we live in America where we have freedom of religion. Why? Because that means I can preach the gospel. And so far they haven't dragged me out of here and saying you can't do that. So I thank God for that. But don't be confused that everyone is free to have a religion does not imply that every religion is true and valid. That doesn't follow. Because you may be free to choose a version of religion or piety that's bizarre. You're free to choose it if you're an American, but it won't save your soul. It doesn't tell you the truth about Christ. It doesn't proclaim the resurrection from the dead and the forgiveness of sins. And so we come to a very important issue that every one of us needs to take into serious consideration. And that issue is, who decides how God will be worshipped? God or man? Well, think about it. In my witnessing to people, this comes up. Came up for me when I was the subject of gospel preaching and I was being hard hearted toward the gospel when I was 20 years old. And in my philosophical mind, I thought it over and thought it over and thought it over and finally decided what does God care? I'm going to decide what I'm going to do and not do. And it's not going to hurt God any. Well, I suppose not, but it's sure going to hurt me. Who decides how we come to God? And my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, if we're saying that God has determined that we must come to him in Christ, we're going to be considered persona non grata. Oh, you don't believe in free choice or freedom of religion. No, you can do what you want. But if you're going to be pleasing to God, you have to come to him on his terms. In the Bible, God decides how we will worship him. I say on my slide here, this goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Has God said... The serpent says, God's too strict. He's a meanie. He won't let you eat this one tree. Never mind that there's enough other trees that you can eat them forever and be healthy and happy and free from sin. Oh, no. It's the one that he said no that we don't like. But that one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, was a line of demarcation. Shall God determine how we will walk with him and love him and know him and worship him? Or are we going to set ourselves up and do it our own way? That was the issue that faced me. And by God's grace, I came to realize that I have to come to God through Jesus Christ. And I'm not a valid lawgiver. 
The Tower of Babel also illustrates that, if you remember the story. We're going to build this ziggurat, this astrological observatory. And we're going to reach into the heavens, and we're going to reach up to God. And God decided that they're not going to do so. Confused their languages. Now let's go to the next part of this same verse, Colossians 2, 23. I got to tell you here, I am so privileged to be able to preach this. When I was unable to even understand this, when I was about 21 years old, digging into the Greek, digging into what was available in the early 70s, and I had to say to my teacher, I don't even get it. I was thinking back this week as I prepared the fact that God has preserved me with health, given me a voice after a manner and a privilege to preach. This is a sacred privilege to be able to share with you what God said, what this text means. The next word here is humility. The context makes it very clear. Perhaps the version you're reading says false humility, excuse me, false humility, and that's what it is. But in the bigger context, they evidently had ascetic practices, which would be severe treatment of the body, that was designed to create some sort of humility. And it may very well have been a preparation for entering in to the local mysteries. Do this, pound yourself fast, go sleepless, observe new moons in certain days. And if you do it just right, you'll be able to go into the temple of Apollos and you might go in there and meet the goddesses and gods and find your ability to enter. So it was a false humility. Let me quote Peter O'Brien in his great commentary from the Word series. Ascetic practices such as these were a kind of humility technique and regarded as effective for receiving visions of the heavenly mysteries. Humility is a very difficult thing to even talk about. Are you humble? Oh, yeah. Well, I'm so humble I can hardly stand myself. Well, that probably is not right, is it? But they had to achieve a kind of humility if they were going to be ready to enter the mysteries. And ironically, once they achieved it, they'd gone beyond Christ and they didn't have any time for ordinary Christians. One of my favorite ideas. There are no extraordinary Christians, but to be an ordinary Christian is an extraordinary thing. And that I will say, I'm honored to be an ordinary Christian. I'll show you later. In fact, I'm going to talk about it right now, Philippians 2. The humility that the Christian is to emulate is that of Jesus Christ. In him are all the treasures of wisdom. And Jesus, who himself existed as God from all eternity, sharing the splendor and glory and incommunicable attributes of the eternal God laid aside his divine prerogatives, not his nature, he's always God, and he humbled himself to be found in the form of a man. The incarnation, according to Philippians 2, illustrates for us what humility is. And we might think, okay, how will that be true? Humility is a communicable attribute. Well, 
Paul says this in Philippians 2, 3. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. So he communicated humility as a fruit of the Spirit and as a life of the Christian, is that I think that those dear brothers and sisters in the body of Christ are more important than me. And whatever God may do with me or through me, he does through many, many others. And it's not how great we are, but how great he is, and that others are more important. Thus, Paul says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So we have this human wisdom and tradition, the dogma of men, that purport to give us the way to superior spirituality, to to enter through the heavenly portals of the mysteries that mere mortals know nothing of, but these things are of no value. They are of no value in checking self-indulgence. Through human effort, people have joined monasteries. Do you know that people trying to be, achieve this humility would, would have themselves hung on shackles up against a granite wall and hang there until all the heat gets sucked out of their body, trying to become humble and spiritual. They would flagellate themselves or hire somebody else to do it. People would join monasteries to be beaten, to do works of super irrigation. What's that? Well, it's not enough what Christ taught. We have to go above and beyond that to something greater than ordinary Christians. That's what that means. It's from church history. And can you imagine having your body beaten, fasting, sleeping on granite, depriving yourself, taking an oath of poverty, taking an oath of submission, obeying everything the religious prelates teach you, and having done all that, Paul says, it's of no value. What? My friends, that happened to Martin Luther. He tried everything the church had for him. And he came to his own conclusion. It's of no value. It's hopeless. God is still angry with me. I'm still a helpless sinner. I'll never escape from his wrath. I'll never escape from his judgment. I've done everything they said, and here I am. And in his despair, he read in the book of Romans, the just shall live by faith. Christ did it all. What he did has value and will change our lives. Believe on Jesus. Again, from Dr. O'Brien, their energetic religious endeavors could not hold the flesh in check. Quite the reverse. These man-made regulations actually pandered to the flesh. Why? Because I start thinking I'm better than somebody else. What did Philippians say? Regard others as more important. Trying to be spiritual by rigorous processes of beating down the flesh actually makes things worse. I heard one preacher say that he fasted so long and then he got up and told everybody how long he fasted. And he, then he thought about what Jesus said about doing your works before men. And he said, I went without food for that long and all I got was the glory of man. What a waste. The flesh still in control. I'm going to give you some implications and applications. And I'm going to end up in Peter. I'm going to show you there the answer that God has. Number one, we must avoid vain worship. Come to God on his terms. We must come to God on his terms only. That's my second point. 
and asceticism, if you don't know that word, severe treatment of the body, cannot deliver anyone from the flesh. It just doesn't go away. Let's go back to Jesus about food loss and about the religious leaders of his day. Mark 7, 7 and 8. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. Now, this again is a, an allusion to Isaiah 29, 13 in the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament. Let me read that to you, Isaiah 29, 13. Then the Lord said, because this people draw near with their words, honor me with their lip service, but they remove their hearts far from me. Their reverence for me consists of tradition learned by rote. Just do the work. What was the, when the debate during the time of the Reformation, when Luther was saying, it's by faith alone, faith alone, Christ alone, Scripture alone, grace alone, to the glory of God alone. And the rebuttal from Rome was, by the work done. That was their slogan. By the work done. Do the work. Do the work. Do the work. Do the work. But I've been trying to do the work. When do I get assurance of salvation? Do the work. The just shall live by faith. The command in precepts and doctrines of men frustrate people, keep them from the gospel. It says in Mark 7, 13, the same chapter, this is Jesus saying this, thus invalidating the word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down, and you do many things such as that. What happened when Jesus kept teaching like that? They plotted to kill him. Wouldn't it be a horrible thing to invalidate the word of God? Isn't that what the serpent tried to do in the Garden of Eden? Invalidate the word of God? You can't trust anything God said. You can't believe what Jesus said. You don't have to listen to Jesus and his apostles. We have our tradition. Just listen to that. That's what Colossians is about. I have no option in my mind but to teach to you what it actually says. Right from the scripture. Human tradition is vain worship. Now that's not saying we don't have traditions in non-salvific things. We may have our words of our songs on a screen or we might read them in a hymnal. That's not about what we're, that's not what we're talking about here. We're free to read the words of the hymn wherever we want to read the words of the hymn or the song. Okay. And there are things that are not the essentials. But this is talking about the essentials of the gospel and what is and is not important. Now let's talk about coming to God on his terms. Here is the gospel. I love this. I love the gospel. I love it more than I ever have. When things get so bad that there's really not much left in this life, what you have is Christ in the gospel. 
the worst, worst, worst moment, we still have Christ and the gospel. Jesus said to him, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Wow, this is loaded. This is important. This is for people who live in post-modernity. It strikes at our very culture. This is offensive to the world we live in. When I was in seminary in the 90s, post-modernity and the feminine goddess had already gotten there. We were ahead of the curve. And there were people I sat in class with who said that if God is Father, I will not come to him and I will not serve him. Well, how are you supposed to preach this verse? Jesus said, no one comes to the Father. Literally, this one student said, my father was abusive. I hate men. I hate father figures. And if that's God, then I won't come to him. Well, so then the professor gave a lecture about God and his ultimate essence is neither male and female, which we can agree with. But the person here saying this I'm the way, the truth, and the life. It's Jesus. And Jesus was a male person, fully human and fully God. And we must come to the Father through him. So we can't get away from it. This is the gospel. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said, have you come to Christ? Have you trusted him? I mentioned earlier his pre-existent glory. Let me mention his virgin birth. Let me tell you about his sinless life. Let me tell you that he predicted his own resurrection from the dead and that he died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust to bring us to God. That he was really raised from the dead. You can't say that about these gods and goddesses of the pagans. Only Christ was bodily raised from the dead. And he ascended into heaven. He makes intercession for us before God. And he's the one who says no one comes to the Father but through me. He said that repentance for forgiveness of sins should be preached to all people. Turn from thinking that you can come to God any way you feel like and come through Christ. But you might say, well, why is God so narrow? No, God is compassionate. He sent Jesus to die for sins, to bear God's wrath against our sin, to do it all for us, to make it possible for any people, any persons, anywhere, come to the Father. Christ's exclusive claims are inclusive of all who believe, regardless of their past condition. Then let's look at Hebrews 7.25. Today, repent and believe the gospel. Come to Jesus and you'll come to the Father. 7.25, hence also he's able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. What a glorious verse. Uh, I, I hate to, can't, no, I don't hate to do it. I keep doing it. Let me tell you about the Greek. I'm happy to. <laughs> Draw near, pros erkamai, is a technical term that's used in the Old Testament for Aaron to draw near if he followed the prescribed ordinances of the law. It's a term for drawing near to God. It's a theme in Hebrews. For us, we sinners who would perish in the very presence of a holy God can draw near 
because of the priesthood of Christ, and he makes us kings and priests to God. The authority of Scripture, the priesthood of every believer. He's able to save forever. The word forever is probably not a, a, a full explanation of the word in the original. I like the ESV here and the K, K, KJV. Forever is not a term for time, but it means completely, entirely, or to the uttermost. All the way to all of the end, whatever that is, in his purpose. We come to the Father. He saves us to the uttermost. And he does so through Christ. And Christ, our high priest, is in heaven interceding for us. Do you believe that when Jesus intercedes for you, that that will be effective prayer. Can you think of somebody better to pray for you than Jesus? Let me give you a clue. It's not Mary. She's a finite person, a saved one, a Christian one, who's in heaven, but finite. Jesus has all the wisdom and knowledge of God himself. And he intercedes for us. Thank you, Lord. 1 Timothy 4 8. For bodily discipline is only of a little profit. Stop right there. That's my excuse, and I'm sticking with it. I'm no, just kidding you. <laughs> Paul's not trying to keep us from exercising, but he's trying to set our priorities. For bodily discipline is only a, of a little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also the life to come. Now, it's probably here, look in the context. Remember last week I was in 1 Timothy about those who forbid marriage and certain foods? I would say to you that in the context, this bodily discipline is probably not talking about going on the treadmill at the gym. It's talking about severe treatment or asceticism, the same topic we have in Colossians. Trying to make yourself spiritual by manipulating what you eat or don't eat. We cannot make ourselves spiritual by rigorous bodily discipline. Thus, we have the same topic. Let me quote the Holman Christian Standard Bible on the same verse. For the training of the body has a limited benefit, but godliness is beneficial in every way, since it holds promise for the present life and the life to come. Thank you, Lord. How shall we benefit? One more slide. Every week, or nearly every week, I get an email from someone who reads CIC, and the persons oftentimes have very severe problems, horrible situations, bondages to sin, horrible Memories of abuse, things they can't get free from, demonic oppression or whatever. And they write to me and they say, well, you warn about some of these things, but how do I get free? How do I get free from bondage? That's the question in the emails I receive. I got one just this week. So I decided, I usually give them a rather quick answer is this. Believe the promises of God. And I realize that maybe they can't fill in all the blanks. But it's the right answer. This passage will help us explain that. 
Before I read the passage, let me say one other thing. For the Christian, and these emailers are almost all Christians. Some aren't. I preach the gospel to them. God has cleansed us from our past. Of all the people on the face of the earth who need not dig around in their own past, it's the Christian. And, and these people are saying, well, but my mother or my father or my situation or what I went through or all the hurts in my past. One guy said, well, how am I going to get free from emotional pain? I wrote him back. Emotional pain is not a sin. Why are you trying to get free from it? What? I wrote him back again. Paul says, I bear witness that with unceasing sorrow in my heart, I'm concerned for my brethren, the Jews. Paul was filled with emotional pain when he considered the lost condition of his Jewish brothers who didn't come to Christ. Well, why was that a good thing? Because if you read in Romans 10, 1, he prayed for them. The emotional pain over what we may have gone through makes us tender-hearted and compassionate people toward the suffering of others. Emotional pain through what may have happened to us might, if we do so in a wise way, make us better fathers and mothers and husbands and wives. Because we could just as well say, what I went through, I don't want anybody else to go through. And I don't want my children to go through this. And I don't want to treat other people like I was treated. And so, as Paul's emotional pain led him to pray for the salvation of his Jewish brothers, ours leads us to be good husbands, wives, mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, workers, because we don't want to go through what happened to us. If God removed all this pain, we'd become calloused people, unable to empathize with anything. So I wrote back, I said, why are you spending your life trying to get rid of what God uses to bring you to himself? But I got to get rid of all these things. I think it was because of my memories. I think it was because of something I did. My friends look to the promises of God. Now we read the text. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises in order that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world by lust. How are you going to escape from your own lust? By the precious and magnificent promises of God. Believe the promises of God. I'm not giving them a trite answer. I'm not being callous. I'm not being uncaring. I'm telling these people who email me the best answer they're ever going to hear. And one fellow, I sent some more, 1 Peter 1, 5 through 9. We, uh, you can look that up. Add to your moral excellence, knowledge, and self-control. Wouldn't that be a good thing to have? Perseverance, godliness, kindness, love. Boy, if we have these things, wouldn't that be great? Well, so Peter says, if these qualities, 1 Peter, 2 Peter 1, 8, are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Where did they come from? The promises of God. How did we receive them? By believing what God said and coming to him on his terms. But what if they're not there? What if I'm a Christian and I'm just a royal mess? Have you ever heard of a Christian being a royal mess? So 
So what do I do? Go somewhere else? Go to plan B? No. Back to the promises of God. Verse 9 to Peter 1 9. He who lacks these qualities didn't go to the inner healing seminar. Oh, it doesn't say that. Let's try again. He who lacks these qualities is blind or short sighted. What? Having forgotten his purification from his former sins. We forgot. My past is forgiven. The blood of Jesus has cleansed my conscience from the inside, having our conscience cleansed, that we might serve the living God. I forgot how great a Savior I have, what great salvation he's brought, what power he's working in my life, and how wonderful the gospel is, and how glorious it is to be part of the family of God. I forgot. And I went somewhere else. May that not be. May we remember the Lord instituted the Lord's Supper and the other ordinances and promises that we may never forget what he did for us. Today, let us remember the promises of God. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your great and magnificent promises. We do need to escape from corruption and sin. May we believe what you've said and not go to the teachings and traditions of men. May our lives so change that people see our love and our good fruit and see that Christ is at work. We thank you for all these things we give you all the glory and praise in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Please stand for the benediction. In Hebrews chapter 13, starting with verse 20. Now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, with the blood of the everlasting covenant, equip you. Start over. Yeah. Equip you with all that is good to do his will, working in us what is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. Glory belongs to him <laughs> forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. <laughs> Go in peace that way.